Hello, everyone. Welcome to this monthly appointment for the webinar of the Data Spaces Support Center. As most of you know, the monthly DSSC Insights series are a key appointment for the, for the DSSC community. So I will, I'm happy to introduce you the, the agenda for today's webinar. So today's webinar will, will revolve around the, on how to build data spaces. We will have an introductory speech from Christina Brandstetter, Chief Marketing Officer for the Fiber Foundation. We will then have a, uh, an introduction on the uh, rulebook from the International Data Spaces Association from Julian Adelberger. We will then unveil the data cooperation canvas from uh, two, with two guests from the uh, city, uh, representing the city of Amsterdam, uh, Jasper Sotendal and Ron van der Lans. And then we will close the webinar uh, with Pierre Gronlier, the chief technical officer from the Gaia X Association. Before I leave the floor to the, to the speakers, um, I would like to introduce uh, just a couple of rules. So first of all, the webinar is recorded. Uh, we, will, we will make sure to share the webinar recording at the end um, af af after the event. Uh, then uh, the, we, you will have the chance to ask questions uh, on the, of course, in the Q&A in the chat. Um, we will make sure and take note of all the questions. And then we will have a dedicated space in the end in which we will, we will, we will make sure to answer all the questions that you've been asking throughout the event. Similarly, I would just like to point out that um, if you would like to stay up to date with all the news coming from the Data Spaces Support Center, uh, you can you can subscribe to the DSSC newsletter. You will find the link in the in the, you find the link in the slide, and then I will uh, we will post the link on the chat so you can subscribe instantly. Uh, that being said, uh, I will I'm happily leaving the floor to our first speaker, uh, Christina Branstetter from the Fire uh, Association. Our foundation, excuse me. And uh, Christina, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Anna. Yeah, my name is Christina Brandstetter. I'm the um, CMO and member of the board um, of Fiber Foundation. And um, I'm honored to open the webinar today. So we heard from Anna already very often the word Data Spaces Support Center. I'm sure most of you know meanwhile what it is. However, give me a second to um, just lay it out once more because it's the uh, DSSC, so the Data Spaces Support Center that offers um, a truly wide portfolio of uh, supporting activities and tools. And one of that is exactly the webinars, the monthly webinars that we are now holding. Um, we call them insight series because we believe we have really lots of insights and also very, very much practical um, um, uh, inputs for you. As part of the DSSC insight series, we'll focus today and specific tools to build interoperable data spaces. So that's the topic of today. So in a nutshell, just very quickly, um, what is the DSSC? It is an initiative funded by the European Commission. Um, it is part of the Digital, Digital Europe uh, program, and it's there to define uh, common requirements, establish best practices, and, and give guidelines. And we'll hear about that in a minute. And uh, all this to accelerate the design and implementation of data spaces and to really speed up with that. So uh, we base these activities on the main pillars of data sharing, a data sharing ecosystem, um, such as uh, sovereignty, interoperability, and trust. And we have, I would say, really 12 expert consortium members here working on DSSC together with a huge ecosystem around it. And I'm, I'm actually so proud being part of this project as well as seeing here um, uh, many people already showing implementations on how to use how to use um, what, what, what's going on in data spaces. So um, let's look quickly into um, how, how we believe to unlock um, the value of data spaces. So just in a, in a nutshell, so data spaces have a huge potential to transform how, how we really deal with data um, in a way how it's op operationalized, monetized, uh, really through, um, through different organizations. Um, we all know it's not an easy thing. Uh, we have a huge complexity in the ecosystems. And very often, and we will see that still, I guess, for a few years, uh, very sector specific solutions and activities and data spaces. Um, however, we need to make sure 
that um, even the different data, species, uh, data spaces can really speak to each other and collaborate and work to each other. So it's all about interoperability mm -hmm. and how we do that. We can see on one of the next slides. Um, just wanted to give um, just a minute a bit of a background that this is not a new initiative, although the Data Spaces Support Center has been existing for a year, roughly a year. Um, it's already back in 2021, actually even before, but in 2021, when uh, Margaret Fastanger um, published that uh, we would really work as a European uh, Commission or a European Union on um, a solid and fair data-driven economy. Yeah, that was a one of the first times this was really completely and clearly laid out and all this in a safe environment and in which data can be shared across sectors really safely. Um, at the same time, um, Thierry Breton, he um, uh, published the Data Governments Act uh, showing that um, remaining in control of who deals with the data and who creates it is really important. And um, so it's all about open yet sovereign. And you will see that through all out the uh, hour and a half that we have in this webinar, that this is really a uh, fil rouge in all what we're doing. Uh, going forward, um, you can see that the Data Spaces Support Center is an integral part of what, um, what we're doing in, um, in, the, in, uh, in Europe for data spaces. It's really there as a great, let me call it helping hand to speed up to make data spaces real in Europe. Yeah. And um, so who's now wondering where the data spaces support center sits? It really sits on it is there for all the projects and all stakeholders that are active in data spaces in Europe. On the next slide, um, just wanted to bring you a um, little overview if Anna could just click here. Yeah. Uh, what is a data space? I know we always have candidates who want to learn what a data space is. We will not go specifically into this today, but just to bring everybody on the same page, it is a distributed system um, defined by a governance framework. And exactly with that, it enables a trustworthy data transaction between the participants. And of course, uh, we do that by supporting uh, supporting through trust and data sovereignty. Yeah, this, this should always, we should always keep that um, very well in mind. And we see on the next slide that uh, not one party alone can build a data space, but we need really different parties working on this. And um, in this one slide that I honestly love very much because it shows that you need to have parties that plan and build. You also have to have those who run it and to really make sure that interoperability is, is um, fully respected and operate in, in, on the operation side, then um, uh, really uh, spread out. And then on the use side, you have those who make sure that the usability is continuously um, uh, made sure. You see different parties here. Um, they all play a, a, a role in either in the consortium or in the current building in Europe. And um, all this, of course, around a federated data infrastructure. And um, uh, I think what we can also use as a takeaway is that Europe playing exactly this model here and giving already a complete frame around it together with the DSSC plays really a, a, a forerunner's role in the world. However, we're not alone. Yeah, so uh, there's activities in the US and China and Japan. And um, it would be very nice, and we can see already some of these initiatives um, watching very much what we are doing in Europe, but um, also picking up many of the things that we are setting up, actually giving us a proof that we are on a, on a good way, or even maybe in the right way. Um, uh, one word on the next slide about um, how this all fits together. So of course, um, the initiative comes from the European Commission. Um, and the EU data spaces support center sits really in the center of everything that we're now doing for data spaces, but it's not the only thing. Um, the, the great um, message here is that many of the, the parties that sit in the consortium of DSSC do have also a very international, if not even global outreach. And with that, I guess we can guarantee that we always reflect what we are doing on um, what's going on in the rest of the world. However, um, respecting very strongly the legal framework 
for the European digital single market. Yeah, It's our ethics and philosophy that will be implemented in everything we're doing. And um, this um, leads us especially to long-term investment security that we believe yeah, um, a great adoption support and that we really stay with norms and standards, but can also influence them proactively while working with them in Europe. On the next slide, um, I just wanted to let you know that um, it, because we want to make it really, we want to bring it down to really hands-on um, activities. Um, the Data Space Support Center continuously publishes updates on how to build data spaces. And um, it, is a, it is a new activity when it comes to really building and implementing. And we want to make sure that we make it as easy as possible. This is why this project is also called Support Center. And with that, um, uh, we work with building blocks and um, further activities to make sure that um, implementation should come across as easy as possible, but also take the lessons learned on, on and, um, and um, built on a, um, on, in a, in a construction of building blocks that obviously grow over time as the use cases grow. And in this case here, you can see that um, we have already published a minimum viable data space offering where um, you don't need to start from a huge complex system, but can really build on um, starting with building blocks um, and grow from smaller to bigger. First of all, first of all um, reflect, uh, re respecting the data interoperability and data sovereignty and trust constru uh, construct, and then really um, move on to, um, to data value creation and data spaces governance plus other, plus other um, um, uh, elements that um, we, um, we're laying out in, in our website, but also in some of the publications that you can find there. Um, it's actually on the next side, slide where you can see how to um, where to get it. I think um, or maybe one more slide, but anyway, here uh, what's what the message is that um, uh, between the different parties, they're working on the data space, the support center. Of course, we need to make sure that the technology is also aligned and harmonized for this. Um, one of the publications was a very great achievement, a milestone, uh, what we call um, the technical convergence paper that gave ground, not only, but one of the grounds to the blueprint. And this blueprint is mentioned here as I would say the best, um, product that you could now get on, at hand where to start in building a data space. It is a 0 0.5 version, a very good one. Um, we wanted to really bring it out as early as possible. Um, it is also a version that will grow um, over the next months to a full um, 1.0 version. But even today, it has already um, a really comprehensive glossary that allows us to speak with the same definitions and language. Um, a very good conceptual model for data spaces and the collection of building blocks that I just mentioned and all that respecting um, the selection of standards that we have that, or that we have and are implementing in Europe. So go and visit this um, website. I think it's really full of helpful information uh, before we go or while we're going then into the examples of the next speakers. I think we have one more slide to um, also make sure that um, webinars are great and you learn a lot from them, we record them and you can always revisit them, but it's also important to meet in person and learn from the others how the experience is with the implementation of data spaces. And for this, we can already uh, announce today that it's gonna be March 12 to 14, this time in Germany, that we will hold the second data spaces symposium in Europe. So you can see here some pictures and re reminders from this year when we did it in Den Haag, uh, March of 2023, but it's already confirmed we go next year into an even bigger and bolder event. Um, we will announce the city very, very shortly, but date and country are already there. So nail it down, put it in your calendar. Um, most of the things that you will hear in this webinar and uh, in the following ones will come very close to you then in March and uh, you can meet many of the speakers there too. And with that, I would hand over to Anna to um, introduce the next speaker. 
Thank you. Thank you very much, Christina. Now uh, we are very happy and honored to have Julian Adelberger from the International Data Spaces Association, and he will introduce the IDSA rulebook. Uh, I think Julian, you want to, uh, would it be okay to take over with the screen sharing? Yes, uh, let me share my screen. So, I hope you can see that now. Yes, we can. Thank you very okay. much. Thanks a lot. And uh, yeah, hello from my side. My name is Julian Alberger. I'm a senior project coordinator at IDSA. And currently I'm in Japan. So what we just heard was the data space symposium, we will have an inauguration of a IDSA hub and a data space discovery day next week in Tokyo. So I'm already here. And uh, this actually showcases um, how important data spaces and topic of data sharing is on a global level. But how do you build a data space? So when we are talking about data spaces, we really need to talk about governance aspects. And also with that, we also need to talk about a kind of playbook. So how, what kind of rules do we want to follow? And uh, what kind of rules are on the table? And this is actually where the IDSA rulebook comes into play. So uh, you can find the IDSA rulebook before I go into details um, at our website um, under most important documents. So this is uh, a direct link to the document. And also you can find it on, in our GitHub repository. So what is the IDSA rulebook? So basically, as I said, it actually defines functional requirements for data spaces. And I will go into detail in a moment. But beyond these uh, functional requirements, we also describe technical, operational, and legal agreements uh, to enable the IDS ecosystems to be fully workable in the real world. And in effect, this actually means that we um, outline a common governance framework that every player, every participant in a data space needs to abide to. So this is actually to make sure that we are um, running a future economy, a future data economy with a specific governance framework that underlies that. And what's also very important here to note is that the IDSA rulebook is industry agnostic. It can be used in different sectors, different branches, and is in applicable in all verticals as a horizontal standard. So talking this was more about uh, the rulebook in general, now let's yeah, dive deeper into the rulebook. And let me start with point one here, uh, the functional requirements. So the functional requirements are actually a separation of duties. And first of all, we need to define what kind of roles the participants will take in a data space. In a data space, a participant can take the role, for example, of a data provider. He provides data to a data consumer. But what uh, is the contract that's being done uh, between those two participants? Um, this is actually where data sovereignty, and we heard this word before, data sovereignty comes into play, which actually means that this data provider can attach certain terms and conditions to its data, uh, to his or her data, before handing it over to the data consumer. The data consumer, in turn, then needs to um, follow these terms and conditions, needs to accept them, and then he is able to obtain the data. You can also find here the usage policy. So when the data provider says, okay, you can get my data, but only for a certain amount of time and only a certain section of my data. I want to, don't want to give away all of my company secrets. So um, you can only see analysis data, you can only see part of my data uh, for your purposes, and this is what you will get then. So what's also functional for a data space is the definition of mandatory and optional requirements. Mandatory, for example, is that we have a contract, a contract negotiation, but also data observability and discoverability, as well as uh, vocabularies and semantics. So vocabularies and semantics actually means that we need to talk the same language. We also really need to find a way to communicate and use the same data formats 
when we want to share data. So this is um, the mandatory aspect to that. And let me give you an example from uh, the a health data space. It's a research project right now, the Health um, X project in Germany, uh, where you can find these mandatory requirements. This is where the patient is in, in the focus of everything. The patient actually gives consent that uh, his or her data, his medical data, can be used by research institutions. For example, there was a new treatment and uh, MRT data, so the metadata of this in the DICOM format can then be used by uh, the research institutions or maybe also by other hospitals. On the other way around, a hospital can share data directly with the patient and they can have it uh, on their phone via an app, for example. But this only demonstrates a little bit um, that um, the data sovereignty aspect is one of the main parts of data sharing in the data space. And this is where, what IDSA wants to stand for. There can also be optional requirements. You can say, I want a marketplace to be um, added um, to the data space or some kind of applications and processing services that can be additional. So also here an example from one of the research projects in Merlo, an educational data space, they want to build a marketplace where the participants can find different services. So educational providers, for example, there's an AI uh, educational uh, career assistant uh, where pupils, but also learners. Uh, so people that already have a uh, track record uh, when it comes uh, to their professional life, they can find and use this AI um, tool, but in only in the marketplace. And they can find this um, as part of a data space. So they log in, uh, to this marketplace, but they can also find this marketplace as they are participants in the data space. And this actually, uh, again, means that every participant needs to abide to the same rules. So only if I um, say I will follow these rules uh, from the data space, then I'm also able to access this marketplace, for example. Uh, part two here are the legal agreements, what technology can fix. Um, Right now, in this year, we had the Data Governance Act, um, but we don't really define uh, the legal contracts or legal agreements here, uh, but the IDSA rulebook um, actually aligns with the CITRA rulebook. So there we find users, policy enforcements, and everything uh, that's related to some of the things that are not uh, done by a technical way, by the technical dimension. So the legal dimension actually is in alignment a little bit to the CITRA rulebook, and we have more of a adoption and uh, consultation function here. Um, but we also highlight this in the IDS rulebook, what's on the market, and there are many gaps by now. They are close uh, they're closing these gaps, for example, with the Data Governance Act, with the AI Act, uh, and everything else on the European level. But um, there will be um, even more uh, alignments and uh, regulatory uh, legal agreements in the future. And the IDS rulebook gives a short overview to that. There's a question. Uh, I think we, we uh, will have time for these questions after uh, each uh, of uh, our speakers. So I think I will come back to this question um, after everyone presented. I hope this is right. Um, then uh, let's come back to the presentation here. Uh, for example, the third part, that's uh, the technical agreements. Um, we at IDSA define, for example, the reference architecture. And the reference architecture for data spaces is our blueprint to build a data space. You can find this on our GitHub repository and it's um, open to our members, but also um, open as an open source element to a wider community. But you can participate more directly if you are a member of our organization, of course. Um, the IDSG specifications, that's uh, more communication wise and also user policy and IDS certification. Certification um, allows here to certify components or organizational um, environments. Uh, we define here assurance levels uh, one to higher levels. Assurance level one, for example, is uh, actually a self-assessment uh, mechanism where there's a questionnaire 
we ask the participants to be open about uh, what kind of data sharing, what they are doing uh, with the data space and assurance level three, for example, that's the, the highest level in this regard. That's actually where a certification is done by a third party and the third party conformity actually then defines if uh, the component is up for certification or not. Um, the IDSS test bed is actually um, our, um, our test bed where we test the different components, for example, connectors um, and uh, the compliance procedures. This is actually something um, where we dive deeper into um, the test, the testing of uh, components, for example, uh, of a connector and how the connector works in a um, minimum viable data space. So this is also something where the rule book actually outlines a little bit what we are doing in the ideas test bed. And you can directly find um, the links here to the uh, GitHub repository. As I said, you can find the rule book in the GitHub repository, but also it's linked to the other aspects of ideas A. So last but not least, uh, we have the operational agreements. And this is um, actually something that I already mentioned here. So um, we want to develop and operate um, IDS compatible data space. And how do you achieve interoperability? It's uh, there where we actually define uh, the standard that we are working on. So the standard um, for data sharing and for data spaces in general, so that different organizations, but also different sectors can share data. And the vision here actually is uh, that we will have many data spaces in many different sectors and also cross country data spaces that can in effect work with each other and share data if they accept the rules that are set out by the different data spaces. So this was a short dive deeper into uh, the rule book and its specifications. What I really want to highlight here is um, that uh, we have a IDS rule book working group. So uh, in 2022, we set up the IDS working group and um, it's a, a process actually. So it's not something that's fixed, um, but um, due to um, our really a great uh, working group here and uh, that it's open also again to our community. Um, we have uh, a monthly group meeting uh, on every Tuesday a month, so from 12.30 to 14 uh, Central European time, uh, where everyone can work on the specifics of the rule book that I just outlined. So this is not something that's set in stone. Um, the, the world of data spaces is such a new endeavor that a lot of um, different uh, people will have ideas uh, what uh, kind of components or what kind of uh, rules need to be added to it. So um, the rule book in itself, as I said, is containing all functional requirements uh, and it connects to the IDS RAM, but it uh, also provides really the basis for maintenance and for reliability. Uh, for IDSA as a industrial standard. That's actually something that we are aiming for here, that it's uh, the basis for a standard that can also be an ISO standard in the future that everyone can actually adhere to. So really summing it up right now, because I don't want to take too much time away from my uh, co-speakers. Um, as I said, due to also uh, our active working group, we will update the rule book now in version 2.0 continuously. And uh, you can find, as I said, the current version on the docs, international data spaces, um, but also on our GitHub repository. And please um, speak for, your, um, uh, for yourself. Um, if you really see that um, the, the rule book can be uh, the basis here for also for the DSSC because the DSSC is uh, aiming to support the creation of data spaces. And what we also are doing here is to support this DSSC project to be successful. And what we uh, want to do is actually to provide uh, the basis for data sharing. And with a rule book, I think we have a nice governance uh, framework uh, that's um, yeah, really reliable, but it's also 
in um, a state that can be continuously uh, updated and is progressive in this regard. So and without further ado, I would like to hand over to the next speaker. I think I should stop then sharing my screen or. Yes, thank you so much, Julian. So um, I, as, as I mentioned at the beginning, it would be good to have to, uh, if you want to answer some question in the chat, you feel free to do that, but we will dedicate uh, the final part of this webinar to the Q&A. So uh, now, uh, without further ado, I'm happy to introduce the next speakers. So it's Jasper Sutendal and um, Ron van der Lans, that they will introduce the Data Cooperation Canvas. And the floor is yours. Yes. <clears throat> Thank you, Anna. Um, I will share my screen and start the presentation. You will see now if all's all right. Okay. Hello, everybody. My name is uh, Jasper Soetendal, and I'll be hosting this part of the presentation together with my colleague uh, Ron van der Lans. And uh, we are both external consultants working for the city of Amsterdam. And for over, 10 year, for over 10 years, we have been working for the city on a lot of uh, data related projects, including lots of uh, data cooperations. And um, for the city of Amsterdam, we are working for the office of the chief innovation officer. And uh, we're both past partners of the consultancy firm Braxwell. So we have both a public and uh, a private uh, role. And um, as part of the preparatory actions for the data space for smart uh, and sustainable cities and communities, communities. we have developed uh, the data cooperation canvas in which we tried to put together all our experience and uh, lessons learned uh, from all the data projects we have been part of or we have uh, have studied. And uh, well, this resulted in this uh, canvas that I would like you uh, to present. And the last part of the presentation, uh, Ron, they will go into more detail of the implementation of data cooperation, but first I will start with what is the data cooperation canvas? Well, you've probably all uh, familiar to the business model canvas, <laughs> which can be used to describe or compare existing business models or to explore new uh, business models. And likewise, the data cooperation canvas can be used as well to describe and compare existing data cooperations and to explore new data cooperations and um, <clears throat> and why do we want to use it we want to use it to have uh, 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 let's I think the data cooperation canvas is like an executive summary of uh, 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 an existing or a new data cooperation and it's the tip of the iceberg because if you're setting up a data co uh, data cooperation there's a lot of things and a lot of documents you will set up. You'll have a business plan, a governance structure, and well, all the things we are discussing uh, today and, and even more. And within all these documents, it might be difficult to get the, the where the data cooperation is actually about. So we uh, so it's very uh, helpful to have an executive summary of the data cooperation, so covering all the important aspects and on a, on a high level. So it should fit on one page and for existing data cooperation, that's very helpful to have a high level overview of what the data cooperation is actually all about. Uh, I think you've all read documents of 30 or 40 or 70 pages and then still thinking, but what is it exactly about? And that is why we are uh, we have used the data cooperation canvas that for <clears throat> or the data cooperation is very helpful to see what is it about. And even if you have, uh, have to compare multiple uh, data cooperations, it's very easy to see the different aspects and if you're doing that that's a very helpful tool for both internal and external stakeholders to have a shared uh, common picture about the data cooperation canvas and to make sure that it's covering all the aspects and especially for uh, exploring new data cooperations that latter part of covering all important aspects is uh, very helpful from the data cooperation canvas. so if you're thinking about setting up a data cooperation that you're sure you're covering all the different aspects. And then <clears throat> let me show you how the data cooperation canvas looks. It's, uh, like I said, uh, like the business model canvas, it has different areas you have to fill in. And in the end, you will have a one pager covering all the aspects. And today I will go quickly 
through all these areas and into more detail on some aspects and not all because that will take a lot of time. And therefore, I would like to know, let, let you know that there is a complete PDF available about the Data Cooperation Campus. You can find it at uh, www.datacooperationcampus.eu. And currently, that's like this presentation. It's uh, 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 in a PowerPoint form, but soon this will be in the form of an actual book uh, within a couple of weeks. And if you download the current version now, you will be notified as soon as there is the book uh, is available. And in this presentation, I will show some parts of the things we are covering in this ebook. But let me first introduce the, the, the aspects of the data cooperation canvas, starting by the middle part is the why. <clears throat> So in the data cooperation canvas, you start by describing uh, the context of what is the reason or what is the opportunity or the ne necessity for uh, a data cooperation, and then describing what the added value or the, uh, uh, the potential added value for a data cooperation is, and specifying the motivation and objectives for all key partners who are joining or who you want to join. So that it provides the context of what the data cooperation is doing. Is doing, <clears throat> and then we have at the left part an organizational part, and at the right part technical part. And for the organization, you want to specify who are the key partners that are involved in the data uh, exchange and what are their roles, what resources are available or required for this data cooperation about people or money or funding or data or data sources. That's uh, something to specify the most essential parts in this area. And then for the business case, you want to have a very high level uh, overview of what are the costs and who is paying, what is the business case for the data cooperation. And uh, uh, there's a magnifying glass because we'll go into a little bit more detail uh, later on in this presentation. And um, for shared processes, I will be covering that uh, as well later in the presentation. And for the governance model, you want to specify what are the rules and the norms and the actions uh, uh, for the data exchange. And <clears throat> in the end, if you want to implement them, you can describe there. You can describe in a few sentences what will be the roadmap for implementation. Will you be starting with one big system, or will you start with a small MVP? Will you start uh, in one region or worldwide or all? Uh, different uh, steps between there. And then at the right side, you have the technical part where you list the, the data, uh, the most essential data and data sources, which we'll go to into a little bit more detail later on. Um, you will have to say something about interoperability because it's very essential for a data cooperation if whether you're all using the same open worldwide standards or there is hardly any uh, shared understanding of all data that will have a, a big impact on how uh, a data cooperation uh, will work. And then the most technical parts is having a list of what technical concept and models you are uh, you will be using, you are using, or will be using. And for the technical infrastructure correct characteristics, you want to have a little bit overview of uh, the infrastructure you will be using or you're planning to use about Will you use cloud infrastructure, what technology stack, what software is used and, and things like that. And last part is the current status because it's very, when you present uh, your data cooperation, it's very helpful to know if you're only exploring it or you're already implementing or you're even operational or in, an, in a scaling stage. So these are the aspects of the data cooperation canvas. And what we've done in uh, the book you can download on the website I, uh, I just mentioned there for each uh, area in the data cooperation canvas, we have specified that we give uh, what you have to fill in there, or what you can fill in there and uh, providing typical, uh, uh, typical examples of how you can fill it in. So for example, for this business case, we have used uh, the starter kit uh, for data space designers from the Data Space Sports Center, listing the typical business models for data cooperation. This is more of uh, uh, inspiration or examples of how to fill in this part of the canvas. 
And another part uh, I want to quickly mention is to define what are the processes you will be doing jointly in uh, the, uh, the data cooperation. Because uh, if you don't have any data cooperation uh, in the whole data flow from creating and storing and combining data, everybody, everybody will be on his own. And it's essential to specify on what parts of uh, this data flow process uh, the data cooperation is about. So are you only uh, have a small API and um, exchanging some data? Uh, do you have uh, some kind of a shared disk or furthermore, having all different sets of what part of uh, the data flow you will be doing together in the data cooperation? Because this will have a huge impact on the rest of the data cooperation. And then again, in the book, there's more details and more examples about uh, the shared processes. And at the same way, uh, like each data cooperation has such a joint activity, uh, this will require a governance model. And that's why we have specified typical parts of a governance model. So uh, this is where we state with input and output and the process in between. This is what a typical governance bar what the typical governance model will cover, uh, again, uh, as a guideline or some inspiration. And then furthermore, we have provided some example or typical governance model. And in the book, there are uh, 11 typical governance models from uh, data marketplace or data, data repository to data trust and data common. And uh, again, in the book, we'll cover this in more detail on describing what these uh, different governance model do and specify. And then on the, on the right side of the canvas for the data and the data sources, uh, uh, we, we suggest a way of uh, documenting the data demand and supply. So it's very important to know from each participants what data they have available and what data uh, uh, they require from other participants or other case stakeholders. And that's something that can be uh, defined in a data demand and supply matrix, which we'll cover in, uh, in the book as well. For example, for interoperability, we provide uh, 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 typical elements that you should mention there. What is the current level of interoperability? What are available standards and concepts and languages and methods? and uh, what effort is required to reach a satisfying level to know what work needs to be done to get the interoperability you need for your data space. So, and again, that's on a high level uh, to, to provide an overview of what is needed on this part. And then I've covered uh, some aspects of it and I would really invite you to uh, take a look at uh, the complete model and then the, the book ends with a template which you can fill in by yourself for your data cooperation. And I think uh, an important thing I want to mention there that it's all interrelated, of course. Uh, if something is, uh, is, is changing on one aspect of the data cooperation canvas, it will have impact on the other one. Interoperability will have impact on data and data sources, which will have impact on governance model. So, um, uh, we have learned that the by that getting them all together in a canvas is very helpful to have that uh, that high level overview. And if that's uh, uh, available, then I would like to uh, introduce Ron. Ron to tell you more about uh, the next steps that uh, can be taken. Ron, go ahead. Thank you, Jasper. Um, yes, um, working on these data corporations uh, and having this canvas, it gives a nice starting point. But then the question is, how do we get on? How do we develop and implement uh, a data cooperation? And therefore we developed also a, a, a five phase model uh, in which you can develop the data cooperation. And if we say data cooperation, we say uh, it's uh, with, and, and we describe in the beginning the, the goal, what we try to do. Uh, and that's a, a full participation of uh, data cooperation supported by a professional data intermediary with a big network of data users and data suppliers. Um, and 
what does it mean, a, a professional data intermediary? We see it as a mid-sized organization that's not-for-profit. Uh, we, uh, we look there at the uh, Digital uh, Governance Act. Uh, with a professional gov uh, management, with market development, product development, IT department, and the professional help desk. And that's, uh, that organization provides professional services to uh, their users. And that means it's uh, attractive uh, data uh, and uh, the, the parties in the network uh, are inter interesting to cooperate with. Uh, it has state-of-the-art technology, and uh, the availability is guaranteed through uh, a professional SLA. Um, and there are clear rules on participation and onboarding, uh, and, and clear uh, cost for onboarding and, and, and participation. And this is all uh, ruled by a, a, a balanced uh, govern uh, governance uh, uh, board which is uh, looking at all the rights of all users. And to make clear what this phase, five phase model looks like, uh, I would like to make it a little bit tangible to use one of the use cases that we're working on in Amsterdam. And that's the problems we have with uh, networks like Airbnb. Um, many houses are rented out like uh, cheap uh, hotels without any monitoring, without any supervision. And it gives a lot of problems in areas where these uh, houses are. Um, and people don't want to live there anymore. Um, less houses are available for people who live there. And uh, investors see the, the house more as an investment and uh, uh, not as a house. Um, when you want to work on that, uh, the cities uh, want to put some rules to that. And for instance, cities will give um uh, 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 uh possibility uh to rent out your house for say 30 days and give them uh, a contract for that but um it's very hard for cities to find out if these uh, uh, number of days is really uh, uh of their out of out of stock and uh, so when you talk with these uh, platforms, they come with all kinds of uh, uh, reactions like, uh, oh, no, it's not possible because of privacy and those kinds of things, and which is, uh, if, you, if it's good to organize, it's not true. But there are some rules, uh, in fact, like that, the U USA platforms who has, uh, 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 has uh, are on the American Stock Exchange, they're on the uh, rules of the SEC. And it says that you cannot share uh, live data that because that's practically what you want. You want to know uh, there are 30 nights and how far are we now? Eh? Is it 29 or is it not the last two, two nights spent? So um, what we did is uh, design uh, a, tr a trusted third party. And I will not discuss all the data flows that we describe here. But in general, we say, okay, in the license, that we that the city give to uh, the houses, it will say a number of nights that can be rented out, but only through platforms that will provide real time data to a trusted third party. And this this uh, so the platform has to uh, uh, deliver out uh, real time data, and the trusted third party will know from the city on every every location what is in the license, and it will check it. And it will not provide any information unless the circumstances in the in the license is overruled. So, in fact, uh, if when you do this, um, the real time data is not a, a offense for the platform because only at the at the moment that one location is getting from twenty nine to to thirty nights, this specific information will be given to the to this city, uh, and this is not a threat. The other thing that we, the, the trusted third party will be doing is by using scraping technologies to check if the owner of the uh, house is not uh, renting out its, its uh, location through the platforms that are not uh, giving us the, the real-time data. Without any uh, uh, extra explanation, I just want to lay out that then it's a quite... Uh, uh, complicated situation that we want to build 
a network of 200 uh, and networks uh, platforms like Airbnb. That's the practice at the moment. And uh, we want to have 60,000 cities having the that can use the services of the trusted third party. And the question is, how do you start? How do you start to build such a big network? We start off with uh, phase one. And of course, the first thing we do is we uh, we have done the data cooperation canvas. So we have an, uh, an overview of what we want to do, want to do. And um, and we say, yeah, we design phase one and we look on, on different aspects on uh, what shall we do and what, what can we do, we can't we do. And the first thing we say is like, when you start to work on this, you probably uh, work from a local budget and which is very small. So what you try to do is to um, to find a group of, uh, in this case, uh, three cities, uh, say Amsterdam, Barcelona, and Florence. Um, and uh, you combine it with the three of the first networks and you try to work on very, very clear use case, which solves a real problem. In this case, we want to have the real time data. So we know when 30 days is the budget is over. Um, and what you do is you, you realize a one-on-one -on -one solution, but in this phase, you also connect to the two cities and to, to other networks, because you don't, you want to provide a solution, not only for one user and one data uh, provider, you want to have a solution which is broader. And that's why you should be very careful on selecting your part participants in this case. Uh, we, we can work with Airbnb and Booking, which are be pretty big, but we also can work with Fairbnb, which is pretty small and works completely different. And what we do is we, we, we uh, already in phase one, we discuss the solution that we are going to make and find out if it's possibly going to work for the two other networks. And we ask to the other cities, okay, this is work, this, this also work for you because in the next phase, you will be implementing the same thing that, that Amsterdam has been doing in the first place. And what's important to know is to, to look at, uh, is the data available, how is it available and how will it be used? How will it be applied? Will it be system to pick it up? And that, that will create uh, added value from the beginning. Um, but since you have, are working with a, a small budget, there's not a lot of possibilities to, to invest a lot of money. So we suppose uh, that, that working with a minimum viable product is the way to go. And uh, and organization-wise, you, you work practical. Uh, in some situations you might already start uh, a not for a not for profit. But in some situations, you're, it's not possible. But anyway, you will be sharing data. You'll be working with international firms, at least at two. So the first thing they will do is uh, give you a non-disclosure agreement, which is in most cases it's a business-to-business -business, uh, 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 variant. And it's good uh, to say, okay, uh, we are government, so it needs to be, this is the government. And there will be a data sharing agreement. When we have found that, that made the, the, the basis for phase one, we go up to phase two. And as I said before, you, you will uh, implement uh, the use case uh, with all uh, on three on three, all networks will connect to all uh, three um, uh, cities and you start on working uh, preparing phase three because phase three is the big leap financially uh, speaking because uh, then you want to build the, the real uh, data exchange you need real money so the first thing you do in the beginning of phase two is think of who is going to pay the, in, the investments for phase three and you have to think of, of what use cases will be uh, interesting for the the, the 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 candidates who are going to finance this, and uh, from the technical part, you will add some things to the MVP, but that will be not a, a big thing. Organizational wise, not a lot of things will be happening, and also from the legal part, things will probably be the same. Only the documents will be signed by more parties, and then we go to. 
the phase three, because as I said, the, the big leap will, you, you see here uh, that the, the financial and, and the top layer of uh, of the, the errors on the right side, you need a big, big um, investment. And you're also starting to work not locally, but you start to work on a national level or EU level. And to make clear, this is, we are building a European network of 60,000 cities and uh, 200 platforms. So, and this might be very interesting for some of the government uh, organizations. Um, from the use case side, you still, you no, don't add new uh, use cases. You just add, uh, you, you're going to implement and, and uh, develop the use cases that you have been developing on phase two. And uh, maybe from the, um, uh, political side for the investors, maybe you'll add uh, one or two extra networks uh, or uh, you, and, and what you try to do is prove if the, the, the concept really works. Um, uh, and what's important also is like when you're in phase three, uh, you are uh, and being a, a government, uh, a servicing government, it might be interesting to look at the networks because maybe you have to create a level playing field. Um, and so more networks would be able to, to connect. From the technical part, you really work on the state of the art uh, technology. You make real investment and you try to be in as independent as possible. You don't work with half, half products anymore. Uh, and you start to uh, work on the professional organization uh, the not-for-profit uh, and start the real governance board where uh, the, all the users are represented. And legally, you make a next step. You, know, you make the formal documents that you will be using uh, by the, the uh, data intermediary in the in the in the final final stage. Going to phase four. Uh, now we are really are uh, going to prepare. Or phase five. In phase five, it says uh, you you don't want to have extra. You don't need extra money, and all you have are, are petitions, are participants. Sorry, the wrong word is there. Participants who are paying for the services, um, and so uh, and and you, you you keep on working with the network that you have. The only thing is you will do is you add new use cases which might be interesting for the, the commercial group because the next step is being really a not-for-profit. And that means that uh, you will put extra in, uh, in, uh, investments in your technology, uh, streamline your IT organizations, your procedures, and make it easy. Uh, you, you need to connect thousands of cities, so you need standard procedures for onboarding and participation. And, and legally, no, uh, things are really like it was in phase three. And then in phase five, um, oh, well, that's the start of the profession of the, of the not-for-profit. Uh, so no extra budgets is needed anymore. Um, and you add more, more cities and more networks, um, making it interesting uh, to, to work like that. Um, and later, uh, you'll add more use cases when uh, the, your users uh, want to do that. And you will invest more in uh, the, the participation is open. Everybody can can uh, uh, join. And there should be clear rules and costs for onboarding and participation. The IT is already professional. And what you do is uh, expand capacity based on the usage and develop new, uh, implement new use cases. And the organization will grow step by step with the activity and the budget. And legally wise, no, no things are changing. So this is our fi five phase model. And if you want to uh, have more information, next slide, you can find at this moment, you can find more information on, on, a, on the website that we show you. This five stage model is uh, not very well uh, already in the in the PowerPoint presentation that's currently there, but it will be in the book, which will be available before the end of the year. Thank you. Thank you very much to Ron and Jasper.
um, I think we will again take the questions uh, at, the, at the very end of the webinar. Now I'm very uh, excited to leave the floor to the Chief Technical Officer of the GaiaX Association, Pierre Grandlet, and he will share a presentation on how to build interoperable data spaces with the GaiaX standards. And Pierre, the floor is yours. Sorry, I was talking muting. Um, so uh, thank you very much for the opportunity here to present some, uh, the, the content. Um, very eager to enter the Q&A session also. The, you will see that I updated the slides uh, because I even reused some content of the uh, previous presentation that I really liked. So uh, to start, Indeed, we talk about data spaces, but data spaces are very, uh, sometimes can be narrowed to data. Data itself is not enough. You have, uh, of course, the infrastructure also under it. And um, a more generic term could be ecosystem, but you can replace ecosystem by data space. It doesn't change much. One other thing I would like to start with is if you want to have two ecosystems that or two data spaces that talk together, work together, then you have a list and an order of things that you need to assess before. And the first one is to have at least one common objective. This common objective, that's that's your motivation. Um, then this motivation and objectives are being translated into policies. Policies, that's the principles, the ideas of how things are done, the plan of action for decision making. Once you have that, you can describe the common procedures and rules. So the order, the method to, for doing something, the permissions, the prohibition, the duty, access right, policy controls, and so on. Then you have the semantic of how did you express those policy and those rules. And at the very last end, you have the technical back, uh, format and protocol. And I, I reused, I took screenshot, I hope that's okay, of, my, uh, pre of the previous presentation because I really like the way it was organized. I don't know if this is a one-on-one -on -one mapping exactly, but I found a lot of similarities by, we start with the why, because that's, if you don't have the motivation and the objectives, then the technical interoperability is less relevant. And you have a big topic on the organization part. The organization for what concerns um, GAIA-X and this, that's the, the two in the middle, the procedures and rules and common semantic. We um, seek to, automate uh, them as much as possible. So we operationalize those common processes and rules and this common semantic by something, by a set of uh, microservices that we, we call the, the Gates Digital Clearinghouse. I will not go in, uh, um, some of the slides are a bit technical, but I will, uh, I will leave that as an exercise for the reader to maybe take that uh, separately or in the Q&A. Um, I would like more to explain why we are doing that and, and how we end up with that uh, solution. So the GAIX Digital Clearinghouse, that's the enabler for two ecosystems to start comparing procedures, rules, common semantic, and aligning to have this interoperability. The Clearinghouse, technically speaking, you have few microservices. The, um, those are microservices that you don't have to use or spawn yourself. You can use uh, online instances that are up and running. The, um, and, and the set of all those specifications that are being written by the GAIX member, translated into label and source code, that's what we call the GAIX framework. So this, the, the GAIX framework, that's the overall set of uh, artifact that we release. And most of them just, um, are here for the to enable personalize the games digital clearinghouse. Um, you have a small box at the bottom of that slice to to unofficially start the uh, GAIX Academy. So we are here in the DSSC event, and I think it's also important to not just have a selling speech for one architecture or another, but to show how that's linked to the building blocks. So those cleaning house with those microservices, okay, fine, you have APIs, nice. But how does it relate to the building blocks? And 
those data clearing house, which are, and this is important, this is not one instance running, but this is a network of synchronized instances. So you can use the one you want. You can deploy your, your own clearing house if you wish to have specific features. And those specific features are mapping directly to um, the building blocks that we have in the DSSC. Considering it was a DSSC insight, I allowed myself to have a draft version of the next document where you see that the number of building blocks have not changed, but maybe the, the name and the title of some of them have been updated slightly to, to be more uh, precise. In the title of the presentation, I also had how to build interoperable data spaces using standards. And I think that's also important. All the source code, all the operationalization that we are that I'm presenting here today are based on existing standards. And you will find the same standards in Fireware, in IDSA, in a lot of other organizations. So going back to my previous slides when I had the list of services, all of those services are based on existing standards. JSON, RDF, W3C credentials, shackle files, the naming conventions from the European Blockchain Service Infrastructure, the IPSI, um, the presentation exchange, OpenID Connect. Um, so those are not invented inside Gaia X. We, we just, we just, we glue them together. Um, but those are very much about the um, uh, W3C. Um, this is a web technology, OpenID Connect for authentication. That's used a lot for policy and policy reasoning. The trust, which we can think um, and have different interpretation of it, is based on very standard X509, I could say, plus D document. Um, and then we, we um, describe a functional way to, to make them working together. So I said that the clearing house, you have different instances and various instances of them. We have a status page where we list all the clearing house that we have in the pipeline. So we have officially uh, three, two, if I don't count the one that we are running ourselves, by partners. So it means that we found partners that see a business value, and I think this is an important word, they see a business value for them to personalize one of the clearing house they can, because they can provide additional services such as what it was described before, the data intermediary services, on top of this common framework that provide an, auto an automated way to assess semantic interoperability procedures and rules. And, and you see that we have um, a, a list of, uh, quite long list of candidates in the pipeline. Back to um, the, um, the clearinghouse, I would like to give one example of the clearinghouse. So we have this network of clearinghouse and we have these ecosystems. The ecosystem themselves that we use the clearinghouse maybe through a wizard, a UI, a catalog, an API, there are different types of tools that they develop themselves. And I think this is also important. The, the building, the blocks in, in a light blue are not things that we develop ourselves. Those are directly microservices, services, APIs that are being developed based on our API and standards to interact with the data clearinghouse to create this interoperability across ecosystems, which means that at the end, the complexity of the clearinghouse that we see in the middle are fading away. A user in the ecosystem ABC will not necessarily realize that they are using clearinghouse from provider Z um, when they want to exchange data or to contractualize with the ecosystem um, from the other side. A concrete example of that is, uh, was presented in Alicante last week during the GAIC Summit. And that's the very beginning of our network of catalog or the famous federated catalog, which is this time truly federated. So we had seven, uh, one, two, three, four, six, yeah, seven, um, eight catalogs that are being synchronized together. Catalog synchronization, catalog synchronization is not new in itself. What is new here is that there is no central authority, meaning that you can create your, you can deploy your clearinghouse, you get in the list of approved clearinghouse that's being synchronized, you have a network of instances, you can use any of the endpoint for any, from any of the clearinghouse and get consumed by somewhere else, and you have those catalog federated. One important point is that 
we don't fed it, we don't synchronize the content of the offering or the content of the data that will be uh, a disaster in terms of uh, cardboard footprint and uh, network architecture. We synchronize the ID of the verifiable controls that are that went through the compliance, so that this assessment of um, interoperable semantic, which means that if you find a service that you like or a data product that you like in one of the catalogs there, it's not the catalog will give you the, the content directly. You will have to query directly on the data owner or the data provider directly. So we, there is no leakage of data um, on the World Wide Web. Um, exactly what, like when you use a search engine, it's not Google who return you the page, they return you the URL, and then that's your access to your page. Uh, exactly the same principle here. Which means that this clearinghouse and the first instances that we have up and running are able to federate really those seven lighthouse projects together. Um, back to the building blocks. Um, one of the exercises that we will, uh, that we need to do also to help um, the community to create and to onboard. So please bear in mind, this is just for demonstration purpose. This is not going to be the, the order or the relation, just to show you the type of work that we need to do. We have those building blocks, um, which are at the moment a bit in silo. Um, but the, the reality from the market is that they are very complementary. You, you cannot have just organization business on one side and the technical on the other side. Um, I'm giving you an example. Here we have access and usage policy and enforcement. So we talk about technical enforcement. In case technical enforcement, such as federated learning, computer data, homomorphic encryption, secure computation party is not possible, then you need to maybe fall back, have a fallback to legal enforcement. And that's why you need to have this contract framework also working together. The trust framework, it's a building blocks that um, uh, automate, this can be a bit risky to say automate, helps you with your uh, modeling, your governance. Who is eligible to make a claim on what or to issue an attestation on what? Well, that's directly linking, that's directly depending of your organization governance. So we need to have this mapping to help. And the, that's the first point. And the second point, that's the prioritization of the building blocks. Because for users that are maybe not familiar with the data space concept and, and everything that needs to be done, it can be over, a bit overwhelming to see all the, this um, work that needs to be done. Um, but they have an order. So the first thing to do is first to work on the organization, organizational governance then regulatory compliance, data sharing governance, and so on. You have a, a logical order of things to take care about in case you want to build or to join or to merge two data spaces. And I will finish on uh, an example of uh, policy reasoning that are based on existing standard, again, um, and that we are deploying to help the uh, contractualization. Here we have an example of a provider that wants to um, constrain the customer when they negotiate the, the access to either the service or the data product to be located in Alicante, Spain, or Brussels. Um, well, that sentence, which can be also located in a contract, can be described in ODRM, which stands for Open Digital Right Language. And here we say that the customer, so the customer that's directly a, a legal participant, can be located. So we will look at the subdivision country code, so which area within the country, in keyword, and then the location of Alicante, Spain, or Brussels, which is described here. So this text that you can see in pure English in a contract, not all of them, but most of them, can be translated into policies where you can put um, on top of which we can perform reasoning, which is very important because we see that regulation is becoming more and more uh, important. And if you want to lower the burden and increase the amount of transaction, we will have maybe not automate all the time, but at least help supervise, assist those uh, reasoning. And the last slide will be a presentation from one of our members that push this uh, example uh, way further 
with um, directly the implementation of a negotiation tool based on Nextcloud and, and uh, tool uh, software, where they um, automated or help with the supervised the supervised the contracting for um, data exchange based on a template with some values uh, that you can fill and uh, a back and forth mechanism between two humans. So uh, the important thing is that this is not automated at all. This is a supervised contracting. The important part is that the, the, the computer, the machine is able to understand this part. The human are able to understand this part, which may be just in PDF. At the end of the transaction, you can sign both and they give you a legally relevant proof, depending of which type of signature is used, of course, a legally relevant proof that the agreement was reached and may be used later because you have the part which is machine readable here, machine to machine. Then you can also implement technical enforcement of it. For example, if you have a, a clause that says, don't use the data after 90 days, then the machine can understand that and enforce it, technically speaking, which I believe is a, a key enabler to help with the transaction of, uh, of data. With that, thank you very much and uh, very happy to take questions. So thank you, Pierre, and thank you to all our speakers before uh, for the very insightful presentations. We did receive uh, a few questions from the audience, which I will read um, hopefully address it to the, to the right speakers. So we could start, we could start with um, a question from Tobias from the, from the audience. Maybe this question is both for Pierre and, and Julien, which is how does IDSA differ from GAIA-X and what do they have in common? Um, Julien, you want to take it or should I start? I, I will uh, maybe uh, just start with a, a small sentence and that refers to the uh, presentation that you gave, uh, Pierre. And uh, this is actually that uh, the trust and compliance scheme that uh, Pierre presented and this clearinghouse aspect, uh, this is not, uh, cannot be found in IDSA. So we are having here a complementary aspect uh, that we are also, um, yeah, communicating in the DSBA and with the different swim lines and uh, the different aspects uh, to data spaces. We are more uh, focused now on building the standard and also the technical interoperability, but trust and compliance is something that's an add-on and additional in our case. And maybe I will just hand over then to Pierre to um, summarize or to add <laughs> no, even Good more. answer. No, I think that's a good answer. Indeed, um, that's the compliance and trust is something that is at the core of gaia -X. And there are things that we will not do, for example, the data um, protocol is something that comes from the IDSA and that we will use the one from IDSA. So again, I think that um, we are very well complementing each other. I do know that our approach are different. We do have developers internally, we read the software, we run services ourselves, but it doesn't uh, affect our, the, the fact that we complement each other. Okay, thank you both Pierre and, and Julian for the, for the answer. I do have another question from the audience this time for Julian, which is how does the IDSA rulebook identify who has sovereignty over certain data, especially where data is reused and copied to another database? Yeah, this uh, actually leads me again to designing a data space and uh, to the rules that you set for a data space. So I talked about uh, how data is shared, what kind of data is shared, but also uh, you need to um, apply and set rules uh, if there is a centralized figure that has, uh, that has control over the policies or not. And um, you're also having to design a data space maybe for a small group, but also this can be a small group for, with known persons. So you know you're dealing with, or even a larger group of all participants. And in the rule, um, we set out how to achieve um, digital sovereignty. So um, digital sovereignty actually starts um, with identity and identification mechanism. So you really want to know who you're dealing with here, actually. And uh, this uh, actually also allows the participants to exert control. 
Um, but as I said, this also depends on the design that you have. So um, how can identities for participants be provided? There can be, for example, a federated system. We heard a lot about federated systems with a distributed design. There can be a centralized data space or a fully decentralized data space. And um, who takes care of um, now the policies and rules for a data space? This could be then the data space authority. In a centralized um, data space, the data space authority could be carried out by one entity. Um, but it can also be by multiple or even all participants. So with a federated system, this would be performed by different federators. And uh, by the fully decentralized data space, these various mechanisms and policies and rules uh, would then um, be available to all participants. But all participants then also need to agree to a certain set of policies. And this also means uh, in effect that um, there can be rules to, um, yes, to ban people if they reuse data and also to, um, uh, to copy data. So this is actually something that is, uh, yeah, can be traced back to the design of a data space. Is there a follow-up question? Yes, <laughs> I hope there uh, is this a... answers the question. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Julia. I I'm reading out the follow-up question here, um, which is how to ensure that the policy enforcement data asset protection um, has been shared, sorry, data asset after, the, uh, after the data has been shared, how is this addressed technically so data copying is not possible? So there are, um, if I, anyone else would like to take it? Please, please go ahead, Pierre. Um, at the moment, we have very limited resources and tools to do that. Um, I, I will not try to say the opposite. Um, there are very few cases right now that we are able to technically enforce. And in fact, the situation is that in the in traditional data spaces as we have right now, everything is legally enforced. And the path we are taking, what the, the vision we believe in is that while some of the use cases will always be legally enforced with a contract, this is why the building blocks of contract framework is extremely important. There are some of the use cases that can be technically enforced. So it's not like one one or the other. It's a it's a, a smooth transition from only legal to more and more technical to help with the legal enforcement. Technically speaking, if you don't want the data to be shared, don't copy it. Um, and then you are not left with a lot of solutions. Compute to data. So instead of copying the data, you bring the workload close to the data, and then you have network isolation. Um, how can you investigate whether or not you have some command line inside the workload that will pre to prevent data to be exported? Also, there may be some malicious actors. So that's a, a very IT security design um, um, yeah, expertise to have. Um, multi-party computation where no one has the full set of the data in one place just have like a um, set of data um, you can do federated um, homomorphic encryption which is a bit futuristic but basically you perform your algorithm already on encrypted data it was very futuristic maybe science fiction two three years ago we have the first uh, industry use cases industrial use cases right now. It's uh, something that is uh, heavily investigated for genetics because in genetics, you don't want your DNA sample to be known and you don't want the algorithm to check your disease to be known. So basically neither another party wants to share anything. They won't all want to keep things secret. So by using, for example, fully homomorphic encryption, you can encrypt your the binary, the, the data from your DNA, you encrypt the algorithm and instead of doing the, the operation, in um, clear, um, um, in the, I, I was going to say maybe I could do an analogy with uh, Fourier analysis and special one, but I, I will not go there. Um, instead of doing the analysis in a clear uh, set, you do that in an encrypted one. It has some drawback. Uh, there is no silver bullet right now, but this is definitely an area where uh, we see future possibilities. Thank you very much, Pierre, for the answer. I do have a question now, which I think was, um, I marked it down for the rule, IDSA rulebook presentation, but feel free to correct me if I'm wrong. It's, do you have a set 
technology stack to build the data that is preferred. I think, Julian, that's this one is for you. That technology stack, um, I have to uh, go back to, to <laughs> our CTO for, for, for answering this question. I don't really know that right now. No. Okay, so thank you, Julian. Thank you again to all the speaker. Uh, we are pretty much right on time to wrap up the webinar. Um, we, I just want to, um, I will share again here in the chat, a link to the data, the data space report center newsletter in which you, you can sign up to stay up to date to the next, uh, to the, all the next event, the Data Spaces Symposium, uh, which will take place, as my colleague Christina said, uh, in March in Germany from the 12th to the 14th of March. And then all the other activities, such as technical releases from the DSSC. I'm not sure if, Christina, you want to say a few words to wrap it up? Well, I think it was an amazing um, webinar because we started from a very high level and became very practical. Um, I also loved, I have to say, the answers of uh, Pierre and Julien, very, very practical how to handle data and um, with the city of Amsterdam to see how this could really look in real life. So these webinars are here to give the tips and um, take out the doubts at the same time to show that data spaces are real. And with that, I guess we uh, made a big step ahead. So thank you so much for everybody who joined today. Thank you. See you at the next webinar. See you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. You then. Bye. Thank you. Bye.